Now, it's really interesting, isn't it, how anxiety has become so trendy, so trendy. And because of that, everybody feels that they have to have an anxiety disorder. It's almost uncool if you don't have a disorder in one form or another. And what you find is because it's trendy, that people want to have it. And ultimately, being normal is, well, it's weird. It's really weird. But here's the thing. Anxiety is not normal. It has become normalized so as people's feelings don't get hurt, people's feelings don't get upset. And I commend that, but I don't commend normalizing something that isn't normal. If somebody had, trigger warning, folks, if somebody had terminal cancer or somebody had a drug alcohol addiction problem, you wouldn't say to them, oh, you know, well, that's normal. Because what happens is when somebody normalizes something is they feel like they don't need to actually do anything about it. They feel like they don't actually need to, to bother getting it fixed. And if you normalize something, it becomes acceptable. But you don't arrive on this planet with things being normalized. You don't arrive on this planet completely being anxious and, and you know, and all that. Maybe, maybe you can be born with a tiny, small strand of anxiety inside you, the anxiety strand, but the actual the actual probability of that happening is very, very small. We develop anxiety. And you know, the really cool thing about it is if you develop anxiety yourself, it means you can also undevelop anxiety yourself. And in today's show, we are going to be talking all about that. But specifically, we're going to take the name of mind, body, and soul literally because we are going to be talking about how it affects the mind, how it affects the body, how it affects the soul. And I hope that all this is working and all this is right and good with the world. So let's let's start out, right, before we get anywhere, how does anxiety form? Well, like we've already said, it's something that's birthed within us. And what tends to happen when you're having an anxiety episode or an anxiety attack is your brain is latching on to so many details all at once that literally you're struggling to focus, you're struggling to absorb the environment. Now, you can be a little bit anxious and a little bit nervous before doing something like a podcast or doing a big meeting. That's one thing. But if you're in a perpetual state of constant anxiety, you have something wrong with you. Something has gone wrong. Now, what we do usually in practicing in, in when I'm working with clients is to sit down and say, right, let's see where the root of this is. Let's see where this began. Let's see where this actually started and originated from. And what you will tend to find is it's usually a situation that has arisen. Maybe it's a party. Maybe it's out and about. Maybe it's a social environment. We're going to hear from Jordan Peterson a recording later on. Maybe it is, is something inside you that you believe that you're anxious because this is often the thing. It's not from other people that they feel these things. It's often that they believe them themselves. And as a result of believing themselves, they end up building this anxiety into something more catastrophic than what it actually is. So after that, what happens is any time you have a situation that arises that looks anywhere similar to the situation that gave you your first anxiety attack, your brain locks on and it says, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Panics, freezes, all of that kind of stuff. And that's how you repeat anxiety over and over again. Now you saw in the trailer where this really handsome fella, whoever he may be, uh, actually said that anxiety can kill you if you do not deal with it. Yes, it can. Now, while well, anxiety isn't directly responsible for forcing things like bipolar syndrome, schizophrenia, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it is directly linked. It is one of the roots that exist with every single case of schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera, et cetera, that I have seen and that I have researched, and many others have as well. So with that in mind, where does it form? How does it form? We've looked at, but ultimately what's going on in your brain? So we're going to get to a little video in a moment. I want to say if you're watching this on Facebook Live, you're missing so much on YouTube right now. You might want to click the link. Go check it out because uh, you're going to miss some really, really cool content uh, and awesome videos. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live and or YouTube, we encourage you all to comment and to tell you know all the really awesome stuff that you've got going on, but more specifically how we can help. And um, yeah, so it begins in a little place called the amygdala. 
Now, the amygdala, you've got two of them, and they sit just above your ears. But rather than me sitting here telling you all about them, how about I show you? Check this out. What I wish I knew at 18 about my brain, the amygdala might surprise you. The amygdala is a small, almond-shaped cluster of nuclei located deep within the brain's temporal lobes. Think of it as the brain's emotional command center. It's responsible for processing emotions like fear, anxiety, and pleasure. When you encounter something scary, the amygdala kicks into high gear, triggering your fight or flight response. But it's not all about fear. The amygdala also helps you remember emotionally charged events, which is why you might vividly recall your first kiss or a terrifying roller coaster ride. It's like the brain's emotional scrapbook. Interestingly, the amygdala communicates with other brain parts like the prefrontal cortex, to help you make decisions based on emotional memories. So next time you feel a rush of emotion, thank your amygdala for keeping things interesting. Stay curious and keep exploring the wonders of your brain. So your brain does keep things really, really interesting. That's the best way of describing it. It keeps things very, very interesting, folks. What it also does is have the ability to lock onto emotion, to lock onto memory, and it remembers specific things. That's why, you know, you, suddenly you feel like you want that bit of chocolate or you want that, you know, um, favorite TV show or whatever else. I'm trying to keep it PG. But, uh, you know, you, you want that thing that makes you feel happy, that releases that dopamine hit inside of you. And what happens then is your brain will lock onto things and say, well, you were happiest when you had this. So I know, let's create this again. Let's create this emotion. But what happens when the amygdala maybe goes haywire? What happens when things get out of control? What happens when anxiety takes over? This is going to blow your mind. Did you know anxiety hijacks your brain? At the core of anxiety's grip is the amygdala, the brain's fear processor. When anxiety kicks in, the amygdala goes into overdrive. This hyperactivity can override the prefrontal cortex, the brain's logic center. Essentially, anxiety stops your rational mind from calming down your emotions. It's a battle inside your brain, where fear often wins. Understanding this can be the first step to taking back control. Okay, so you heard uh, right there that when your brain essentially gets out of control, your, your brain essentially is to do... A couple of things. One of them is to protect you. One of them is to essentially help you thrive. And the other one is to look for ways to escape dangerous situations. Now, if you've been in an extremely dangerous situation before, if you've been in an extreme situation before, you will know you feel that little bit of anxiety, you feel that little bit of unsettled, or you might have a full-blown panic attack. Okay. And what happens in that moment is it's your brain saying, I can't cope, I can't cope, I can't cope, I can't cope. And you become perpetually terrified because you feel that people are looking at you. You feel that you are standing out. If you're having anxiety about a situation, it's often related to the fact that you don't believe in yourself, that you can actually do what it is, which is often a lack of confidence. Now, what that comes down to is simply asking you questions. Do you have the ability to deliver through what it is that you say that you're going to do? More and more teenagers around the world are struggling with anxiety than ever before. Why? Because this comparison syndrome nonsense that is out there is literally fueling it left, right, and center to the point that teenagers cannot cope and cannot be themselves. Where has this been fueled? Well, guess what? You might be surprised or unsurprised to know that social media has been one of the biggest contributing causes to this comparison syndrome stuff that's going on all over teenagers' lives. There was a conversation that was had recently with ChatGPT, and it wasn't me, but I did happen to see it. And basically, the conversation went something like this. If you were the devil, how would you distract people? How would you disturb them? How would you torment them the most? And ChatGPT came back and said, well, if I was the devil, what I would do is this. I would literally create a world full of distraction." And that's social media, that's pornography, that's TV, that's conversations that really don't matter, it's conversations that have no benefit, no fruit to them. <clears throat> if I was uh, the devil, I would also 
look at doing things to people that force them to have comparison syndrome. Now, what's comparison syndrome? It means that you've got what I want, or I don't feel good enough about myself because I want, I'm possibly not where you are, and I want what you want which is also a really, really dangerous thing. And this is what's happening with teenagers all the time. You hear them talk and they will say things like, don't feel pretty enough. They don't feel strong enough. They don't, they don't measure up. They don't have the body that they want. They don't have the look that they want. They don't have the expression that they want. They don't feel that they are able to contribute to society in the way that they want. They don't feel as if they really matter, that they're really valued. And where does that come from? Because all these beliefs are learnt. All these beliefs are learnt. And with anxiety, if you're having full-blown anxiety attacks and it's affecting the mind to the point that you're having PTSD, that you can't go to school, that you're having, you know, bouts of bi or it's it's triggering bipolar syndrome, that it's triggering schizophrenia, that it's triggering to you to a point that you don't want to be um, in these social settings anymore, you then have to ask the question, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? It is really vital to know where it's coming from, because once you know where all of it's coming from, you can actually start to do something about it. So it begins in the amygdala. It goes through the anterior cingular cortex, the ACC, and then into the hippocampus. And, it, and the ACC amplifies the signals of fear and threat. Well, the hippocampus responsible for memory triggers anxiety based on past experiences. So literally, it is fighting against itself. And this is why Buddhist teaching frequently tells there is nothing more dangerous than a thought that is uncontrolled or an uncontrolled thought. For example, memories such as traumatic events can cause a hippocampus to send fear signals exacerbating anxiety. So for example, if you are, let's say, going to speak your son or daughter. Let, let's 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 go with the family environment. If you're going to speak to your son or daughter, and it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation, it's going to be something that's really difficult. You may have a memory of, of speaking to your son or daughter before, where they flew off the handle, that they were really angry, they were really annoyed at how you responded. How could you say that to me, mom? How could you say that to me, dad? Da, 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 da. And before you go and speak to your child, that's what they do. That's what's coming up. And you're like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh, I can't can't do this. I can't do this. So you don't deal with things. You end up putting your head in the sand like an ostrich, and you allow things to happen. Now, the danger when you put your head in the sand and allow things to happen is you have zero control over what happens to you, what the response is. You must, when it comes to anxiety, understand and know in yourself and ask one really critical question. Is what I am fearing right now a logical or an illogical response to anxiety. For example, logical response is, uh, let's say, you're, you go out into a, a shopping center, and it's really, really busy, so you feel a little bit like, oh my goodness, this is terrifying. If you are going to the shopping center, and it's really busy, it's terrifying, yeah, that could be a logical response, because again, it's, it's really, really busy. An illogical response to anxiety is stepping outside and believing the whole world is just going to fall apart. It's unlikely to happen. It's also as unlikely that you're going to get beamed up by aliens. It's also as unlikely that, you know, someone is going to come rushing to your front door and is going to shout ball at you. Very unlikely. The logical things about anxiety is maybe you'll bump into somebody on the street that you don't want to see. Maybe your child will be really grumpy with you and really frustrated with you for no reason apparently. Maybe the shopping center will be really, really busy. So then you start to look at ways of trying to deal with these things and trying to build them. But ultimately, if you don't deal with things in the mind, it's going to spread to where we're going to look at next after commercial break, which is the body.